Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at a myriad of issues ranging from the responsibility to protect to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency and to several others. My guest today is an expert on these issues. My guest today is Ian Williams. Mr. Williams is president of the Foreign Press Association. He is also the author of a very interesting book titled Untold, The Real Story of the United Nations in Peace and War. Ian Williams, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Good to be here with you, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. Ian, we're going to get into your book in just a moment. But first off, just very briefly, what is the Foreign Press Association? It's a 501c3 nonprofit, I assume. But basically, what's its mission? Uh, it was founded in 1918 by sort of leftover correspondence from mostly Europe after the First World War. And it's, uh, it's existed to provide aid and comfort to foreign correspondents in the US ever since. Um, so it, it, we celebrated the 100th, the 100th year anniversary. Uh, when was it? Uh, two years ago mm -hmm. uh, in, in 18. And uh, we're sort of, we have a lot of programs and during Zoom, we've been covering a lot of American issues and international issues with America as a focus to bring correspondents up to speed. And because they can't get out much, as you know, <laughs> it gives them a chance to do their research from their computer desks. Exactly. COVID has limited our mobility, to put it mildly. And our viewers can go to your website at www.foreignpressassociation.org and get more information on this very interesting group. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book. I, it's a great book. It's, it's short. It's very easy to read. You can get through it very quickly. And it's just loaded with information and anecdotes. And it's titled Untold, and that's capital U, capital N, for United Nations Untold, the real story of the United Nations in peace and war. Why did you write that? Well, it was a follow on to the book I wrote for the 50th anniversary of the UN called The UN for Beginners, which is a fairly, the beginners series is a fairly famous one. And I thought the UN really needed it because it was big, it was complicated, people were interested, and it was very, very boring. People, you know, fall asleep when the UN is mentioned. In newsrooms <laughs> all over the world, they fall asleep. In classrooms all over the world, they tend to fall asleep. So I thought, how can we make it exciting? Well, you know, part of it is the action and, and the, 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 the sort of real hard politics, but also to poke fun at it. In some ways, um, satire and sarcasm, when the UN manifestly fails to do its job or the, the great powers stop it doing its job, and also um, just the lots of funny incidents. You know, the, you've got a group of people from every country in the world and they're all gathered in the, on Turtle Bay there uh, the, the, by the East River and they do silly things sometimes. Sometimes they do brilliantly imaginative silly things as well. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, out of all the stories in there, is there one that's very brief you could mention? Well, my favorite was, uh, you know, everybody, they, they, during the General Assembly, they all make long, boring speeches, often identical, and they give copies out to people uh, and, and then go and read their speech for everybody, for the record. And there's one very hot summer, about many years ago now, but the ambassador for Bhutan, in a spirit of Buddhist self-sacrifice, looked over the audience, which was flagging and sweating, and said, you know, this is really silly. Why don't we just take my speech as read? It's there in front of you, take it home and just close the session. Oh, no, if we saw more of that in the UN, it would be <laughs> it would be really good. And then Khan, Khan Russ, for example, he was on the sanctions committee, the British delegate, a role which he hated, the Iraq sanctions committee. So he decided it was all getting too tense and started playing, <clears throat> started a program of classical music to be played during uh, yeah. the, during deliberations. It, it's those type of gestures that make the place human and make it bearable and workable. It, it, they certainly do. And as has been mentioned, negotiations move at a glacial pace at times, and there is a lot of grandstanding and that type of thing. But the UN does impact our lives, uh, just about all 8 billion people on the planet. But let's talk in general terms. Uh, you're a student of the United Nations. You followed the UN. You know it very well. How has the UN 
from that was created in 1945, principally by Franklin Roosevelt and some of the key players, the victors of World War II. How has that developed and how has the mandate changed over the last really 76 years or so to move from trying to put an end to war to promoting uh, economic and social development and enhancing human rights? Well, you know, a lot of people have tried to reform the UN Charter and, you know, and say it's pretty much unreformable. But it has actually changed a lot. The what the UN does and how it works is very different from 1945. And it's been done without actually changing the Charter. I think this was epitomized with Kofi Annan, the responsibility to protect. Because um, basically what he did was to redefine the UN Charter. Because the UN Charter has got, you know, it's very solemn. It's an, it's, it's, it's a, it's a union of nation states. It's a club of nation states. And the main thing why you hear it tiresomely, usually from people who are doing really nasty things, is the sacredness of uh, non-intervention, of the sovereign right of nations to kill their own people without interruption, is what usually translates that, and. That's very solemn and sacred, etc. So what Kofi Annan did was basically he got a, all of the countries in the world, all of the heads of state at the uh, at the Millennium Summit, to declare that this didn't apply in cases where the governments were failing to protect their own people from themselves. So basically, he he managed the diplomatic equivalent of pulling the tablecloth away and leaving the table setting intact. So we actually got. You know, the UN Charter wasn't changed, which would have taken horrendous amount of work, two thirds majorities, et cetera, et cetera, the connivance of all five permanent members, but he reinterpreted it. So the responsibility to protect, which, you know, I think was a good thing. Unfortunately, it was pretty much, it's been thwarted in application because the Iraq war followed when it was, the concept was grossly misapplied by Tony Blair in particular and uh, George W. Bush. You're right. And the responsibility to protect, as I recall, that was drafted or adopted by the General Assembly in 2005. And for it to be successful, it really depends upon, as almost everything within the United Nations system, depends upon the goodwill and involvement of the members, especially the permanent five, the five permanent members of the Security Council. Have they not stepped up on this? No, they've tried to use it expediently now and again. It's very interesting to go back, as I did. Um, before it took place, uh, Lloyd Axworthy, the foreign, Sec forereign minister of Canada, sent a set up a commission to go around the world. And it's often called the Axworthy Commission. But then he lost his job and the Canadian government shelved that. But it's still there if you look it up, the Axworthy Commission. And it was very interesting because they went to all the different countries and took evidence from them about what their worries were. And their worries were about interference. They would be used as a cover for imperialist intervention in their countries, which it has been. Uh, but then on the other side, there was the worry that people would use uh, national independence as um, a cover for mass murder, as the military regime in Burma has done with the Rohingya and the ordinary people of, uh, of um, Burma at the moment. So, you know, it covered a lot of contingencies, but the concept actually got a lot more traction um, than people expected. Uh, certainly Kofi Annan, though I spoke to at the time, he thought it was a long-term project. It was the idea of getting the concept across. So it percolates in there. And now you, you find it invoked and there is a general acceptance that yes, we should interfere in Myanmar. The second part of that is how because it's, it was mentioned in the Axworthy Commission, uh, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And it would be difficult to argue that any, most of the recent US interventions have uh, been especially productive in terms of uh, long-term peace and security or, or, or securing the rights, lives and liberties of the interventions. And, and that pointed out what people were saying, the politically um, expedient nature of a lot of these interventions. But they forget there were some very successful ones. The US put forces in Macedonia on the border at the height of the Balkan Wars. And 
just took 600 Marines and a couple of Scandinavian uh, and there was no move. Macedonia stayed out of the Balkan Wars for the duration because Slobodan Milosevic knew that this was a thin blue line and if he touched this, he would have a big club coming down on his head. So he stayed away. It was, you know, but it, it was a token, but it showed that they were serious. One of the problems with UN peacekeeping is we often put people in there and then leave them to hang, you know, to leave, leave them out hanging on the line to die. We did that with Bangladeshis in, in Bihach in Bosnia. Um, we're probably doing it in several places around Africa at the moment. Uh, and of course, famously, there's Rwanda, where Romeo Dallaire was left, left out, hang, was hung out to dry by his own government, his own military and the UN uh, at the time of the Rwanda crisis. I mean, the point about having a thin blue line is it's got to be a tripwire. It can't just be something that people can jump up and down on. But it has worked occasionally. It, it has. Know. It certainly has and saved untold lives and suffering without a doubt. There's another area, too. The UN is, is the, really the only international forum in the world to bring all of the countries of the world together. Right now, there are 193 members of the UN General Assembly. But one agreement they came up with back in 2015 was the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And that main goal, the only goal it had was to keep Iran from developing nuclear capabilities. And the thing was actually working until the United States pulled out of it. Where are we on that? We may be going back into it, but there's, as of this taping, there's been very slow movement. There's been lip service paid to it, but not much action. Where, where are we on that and how important is it? Well, it's important if you don't want a nuclear Middle East because it follows from all of these. Um, you know, um, I've got no particular love for the Ayatollahs, uh, but they have never invaded another country. They have promised they don't want nuclear weapons. They have called, along with Egypt, for a nuclear-free Middle East. And yet they're treated as the rogues in this. <clears throat> and uh, as we all know, the, the big thing with the Iranians is they say, excuse me, um, there's that little country on the Mediterranean, 200 nuclear weapons and no one mentions them. This is, you know, it, it destroys the whole principle. So, you know, to, to harp on at Iran, there is a, a pathological thing in Washington. Uh, they've never forgiven Iran for the hostages, uh, but then the Iranians have never forgiven the British and Americans for overthrowing Mossadegh and reinstalling the Shah back in the early 50s. There's a lot of not forgiving going on. And it's sometimes necessary to pull back and draw perspective on it. And the UN is a good place to do that because people can remember. But then there's an awful lot of bullying because countries don't always vote their conscience. Um, if you get a phone call from the White House saying the aid check stop tomorrow, uh, if you vote the wrong way, then <laughs> people do take notice although amazingly amazing number of countries ignore that and remember that happened at the time of the first iraq war where yemen was told it was the most expensive vote they'll ever make uh, because uh, when it voted against the invasion of iraq right and this this iranian nuclear deal is extremely important also because uh, the alternative is just unthinkable. As you mentioned, if we want a stable Middle East, we don't want nuclear weapons in the Middle East, or no more than they're there right now, we need to move back into this agreement very, very quickly. Because if we don't, you can, you can only stand outside and sit on the sidelines so long until something drastic is going to happen. So it's in the best interest of the United States and the Iranians, and really everybody in the Middle East and people around the world to move back into it. But by the time this program airs, we may be back into it or moving in that direction. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved, with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an intra-campus television hookup with an educational institution or a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our programs, you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided 
at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking with an expert on many of these international issues. I guess today is Mr. Ian Williams. Mr. Williams is the president of the Foreign Press Association and also the author of Untold, The Real Story of the United Nations in Peace and War. Ian, we could, we could spend an hour or two on each of these issues without a doubt, uh, but uh, let's talk in general terms. We're, we're seeing a variety of conditions or trends taking place around the world. One, there seems to be less information. I know just in the United States, as I interact with people and read articles, it seems that people have less of an understanding of how important institutions like the United Nations happens to be, or perhaps being involved in the European Union. But there's a lot of misinformation that's out there floating around. And it's there are people, it, it seems like it's accelerating. I know in Germany and Austria, especially in the United States, where you have so much in, misinformation, disinformation about what's going on, about multilateralism, about why we should not be involved with anybody in the world. We should stay to ourselves forever. Do you see that developing? Is that a, a, a worrying trend that's taking place as nationalism, neo-Nazism, the QAnon activity, and different uh, movements like that? Well, it's a lot more visible than it was before. I mean, when I first started talking about the UN, uh, people don't even understand the reference anymore, but black helicopters will bring it back to mind for you. There are lots of people in the United States who believed that the UN had peacekeepers who were flying in in black helicopters to take over the United States. That was sincerely, truly believed by many Americans. And, you know, on one level, um, it's almost disappointing the UN doesn't get this type of scrutiny from middle America anymore. On the other hand, it, 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 it's good. It's, all, it's not true, it's but all. it's not true, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't think the UN is important enough to vilify anymore. But, you know, for a time, almost every nutcase cause in the US was, hang, was hung on the UN. I mean, because the UN has treaties on arms trafficking, it came into the sights of the NRA, not because the NRA seriously thought it was a threat, but because they felt that by attacking the UN, they got themselves a ready audience. Uh, you know, there, there are loads of kooky lobby jobs. The, the anti-abortion lobby has an office working hard at the UN and, uh, and swinging from the trees to, to, to prove its point. And once again, it's harnessing the, the what they think is the bedrock anti-UN skepticism out there in the heartland for donations. Um, I was even invited to speak at the Conservative Political Action Committee some years ago and debated Ron Paul about these issues, uh, which was which was fun. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> There's a tape of it somewhere. And uh, he, you know, I, I quite enjoyed it. I, I mean... The, the point was he thought it would be a pushover and he kept falling in the holes <laughs> that he dug. He, you know, he wanted to make it illegal for states like Maryland to um, accept a world, uh, a UNESCO heritage. And I said, excuse me, I thought you believed in states' rights. And, you know, oop, no, <laughs> That's right. not those states' rights. It's a bit like <laughs> <laughs> And the thing is, too, with so many of these UN programs, they benefit people in this country. I, I live in Kentucky, and we we are participating in the Man in the Biosphere program operated by UNESCO. And it has been a lifesaver as far as protecting Mammoth Cave National Park, which was really turning into an open sewer. It was about to be destroyed. And the people in that area, the farmers, the folks from the Western Kentucky University, the Chamber of Commerce, they all came together, the Area Development District, and they applied to UNESCO to have technical assistance to save Mammoth Cave. And they did, they turned it around in about two years, they developed a strategy, it's working very well. UNESCO doesn't control one inch of territory of Mammoth Cave, but if you listen to right-wing radio, if you listen to some of the uh, misinformation coming out of the TV operations like One American News and Fox and different ones like that, you'd think that UNESCO controlled 
<laughs> not only the, the park, but also the whole state. But I, I digress on that. But, you, but you're right about this misinformation. But what can be done to overcome that? What can be done to turn that around? Well, you've got to make things interesting for a start, which is what I was trying to do. Um, if you, um, you know, look, most, most UN press releases, most UN speeches are boring. <laughs> they're, they're filled with inflated persiflage. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're like souffles. The minute you pierce them, they disintegrate because all the air's got out of them. Uh, so, you know, sometimes this is necessary because you're trying to you're trying to pretend there's achievement to keep everybody happy. So you inflate what's happened. But other times it's simple, like George Orwell said in his politics and the English language, you're trying to cover everything with, with snow to smooth off the, uh, the, the sharp edges, um, the, the fact that things aren't really working very well. But then, you know, there's also, uh, I mean, it's, it's a textbook case. Uh, I do teach uh, press releases and writing and the UN is classic, you know, it never does anything. It's always proceeding to take initiatives towards a high level committee to consider possibilities, I mean, <laughs> which sometimes is a very accurate description. They're not doing anything. They're spinning the wheels. But other times it really is just uh, it, people go on um, automatic pilots when they start writing and reading on the UN. And this makes it impossible for people to read, uh, to, to get as any hard kernel of truth. And they don't like it. The UN bureaucrats don't like it if you say something. Because if you say something concrete, people might disagree with it. <laughs> so, so it's much better to say something evasive on the grounds that they have to work very hard to find out what it is they disagree with. Right. And of course, the UN actually has boots on the ground. There are people throughout that whole UN system that are working on issues like, uh, well, World Health Organization, UN Children's Fund teaming up with Rotary to eliminate polio. You've got other UN agencies that are helping to move aircraft, ships, mail, weather information around the world. There are services being provided with the uh, to folks who are in, um, well, refugees, for example. We're at 85 million refugees this year. So there's a lot going on with the UN system, but they need to jazz it up and to make it more saleable and more readable and more interesting to get that word out about that whole broad complex of UN agencies because as Madeleine Albright said the UN is indispensable but it's not a perfect organization nobody will ever even people at the UN will tell you that so but Ian we unfortunately we've run out of time I hate this but, but uh, do you have 30 seconds of closing remark well I, I actually out John Bolton Bolton once I said that the UN should be that they should demolish everything above the third floor, which is where the press floor is, because it's not what the UN does, which it often does very badly and makes a mess of. It's what it stands for that's important. People come from all over the world to lay their hands on the UN because it symbolizes something else. There's something between their government and God. It's very difficult to persuade a congressman about this, but um, the, there is something between world government, the governments of the world and the, the, uh, and, and the heavens that people where people can go to that sets rules for people and uh, it's something that we we should remember without all of the rest of the stuff it's uh, it, we we need that core of the UN the UN charter is what all of this is hung on so uh, we can't throw out the baby there because the bathwater all goes and the bathwater is all of those things you mentioned Right. And you're right. The, 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 really, you come right down to it, a large number of groups around the world, businesses in particular, are getting very involved in the United Nations with the UN Global Compact, working on uh, combating corruption, working on climate change issues, just on across the board, non-governmental organizations, service clubs like Rotary International, Lions International, Kiwanis, they're much more involved in the UN as they start moving towards these issues. But these are ones we'll have to pick up later, Ian. But Ian Williams, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.